May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable in your sight, my Lord and my Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. To those of you that I have not met, hi, I'm your new rector, Father Jim. <laughs> so good to have you with us here today on this incredible day of resurrection. Because where were we last year? We had only been in our mess of COVID for a couple weeks. The church I served in Orlando hadn't even installed cameras. I was preaching to an iPad. It was a sad Easter day on one level, but on another level on our Facebook stream, you could see everyone, happy Easter. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. The life of the church goes on because the life of the Spirit has been given to us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But who knew Zoom would be a well-known word? Zoom family meetings. Zoom vestry meetings, Zoom home groups, Zoom Bible studies, even Zoom weddings and Zoom funerals. It was all new to us. Masks on, handshakes and hugs, no. Sanitizer for everybody, personal connection diminished. Smiles could be seen from the nose up. And even with limited community, again, the church goes on. It is so good to see you filling these pews this morning. We navigate these waters with care, with caring, firm, but still thirsting for community, for relationship, and for the Spirit can give us. We came from a pre-COVID world to this new environment that was foreign, often fear-inducing, and we wondered what was lost in our lives. We may have more in common with our disciples this morning than we think, for they experienced the very same thing. Earlier that week, they entered Jerusalem to sounds of Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he in the name of the Lord. Six days later, he was dead, taken off the cross, buried in a borrowed tomb. They go this morning to do the final preparations that they didn't even have time to do before the Sabbath hit on Friday evening, only to find the tomb was empty. So early in the morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled from the entrance. And so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, one whom Jesus loved. By the way, in the Gospel of John, that's John. He's a everybody that he was Jesus's favorite they have taken the Lord out of the tomb they said we don't know where he has put him so Peter and the other disciples started to the tomb they run to find out what was taking place and they see these empty linens one that wrapped his body and one that was for his face and this is important because it says the cloth was folded up by itself separate from the linen to us, we're just wondering, is he separating whites from darks? No, that's not what he's doing. There's actually a deep Hebrew tradition about this. When a servant set the table for the master, they would make sure that everyone, everything was just as the master wanted it. And after dinner was taken place, the master would show that he was finished by standing, wiping his uh, napkin around his face, balling it up and leaving it on the table. That way, the master knew, uh, the servant knew that the master was done. However, if the master got up, folded the napkin, set it next to his plate, it would tell the servants, I'm not finished. I'm coming back. Peter comes in today to see a folded napkin, and it tells him, I am not finished. I am coming back. This is not the end. Easter is not the end of the story, brothers and sisters. It is the beginning of the work, beginning of the gift, beginning of the redemption that we will see played out in all the days and weeks to come of our liturgical cycle. And even in the midst of that symbol, Mary in her grief still weeps. And we get an image of what grief does to us. It blinds us to what takes place around us. Fear blinds us to what is there to be received. And she peeks her head in the, in the tomb one more time, only to see angels who proclaim what the disciples recognize. He is not dead. He is risen. 
just like he said he would. And he turns, and she turns, and there he is, still in his transformative state, still not completing the task, and says, go and tell. Go and tell what has been done. Go and tell that I rise again. Go and tell that I have died to redeem the sins of your hearts, of your past, and of your future. Over this Lenten season, we have been doing a study between the services. It's called from a book called Leaving Egypt by a therapist and theologian, Chuck DeGroat. He uses the Passover story, the story of leaving Egypt, moving into the wilderness, and finally into the promised land as a metaphor for our struggle of bondage and freedom as we navigate being flesh and spirit, people of the world, but people of heaven. In the later chapters, he closes with a phrase from John Chrysostom. He says, it is not enough to leave Egypt. We must be willing to enter the promised land. He continues and says, for many of us, like Israel in the wilderness, life can be a little more than survival. And living in survival mode does strange things to people. For many of us, difficult experiences in our childhood lead us to compartmentalize the tough things while presenting to the world a more put-together person. Some have called this the false self. We become the tough guy or the flirtatious girl. We assume the role of a devoted servant or simply want to fly under the radar where nobody recognizes who we are or what we're doing, all to gain acceptance and approval. Brennan Manning writes this, the false self suppresses or camouflages feelings, making emotional honesty impossible. Living out of the false self then creates a compulsive desire to present a perfect image to the public so that everybody will admire us. However, no one will know us. What we discovered early in our exploration of the Exodus story is that slavery ate away at their identity, at their sense of original story that came out of the garden of creation and love given to us by our God. Robert Mulholland writes this, our false self, having removed the roots of our identity meaning, having pulled them out of the original place of knowledge and the love and Lord, um, they get planted in new locations. We find new identity, new purpose, and new meaning that are sometimes counterfeit and not original. Among such soils are our sexuality, our possessions, our status, our profession, our performances, our relationships, our wonderness, our resentments, our bitterness, our culture, our geographic place, our intellect, brothers and sisters, it goes on and on and on. Our false self has constructed a complex nexus of soils in which the roots of our very being are grounded. To survive, we construct identities that suit us for a time, sometimes for a lifetime. But occasionally, just occasionally, someone cares enough to peer behind the curtain to see and challenge our pretense and to invite us to be our true selves. The great 4th century, uh, uh, again, John Chrysostom says, it's not enough to leave Egypt. One must be willing uh, to risk entering the promised land. Because entering the promised land requires us to become unburdened, free from the false selves that hold us captive. While the wilderness exposes those false selves, it is difficult to live honestly, to live consistently, to live wholly. That is why we need community. That is why we need the church, and the church at its best welcomes us in in all and every condition so that we can be fed by sacrament and by word and renewed and reminded every week of the redemption given to us by Jesus Christ. This is the freedom given to us today, bought by his death his life, his resurrection. For today, brothers and sisters, is a new day. You've heard me say this isn't some just holiday. It's not a day just to get pretty, do Easter eggs, and go to brunch. This is the day that changed the universe. This is the day that gave us freedom from who we are to who we can be. 
knowing that we've been redeemed. Who here wants to pay for their own sins? From this morning. Any arguments before we came to church? Any frustrations about getting dressed? Who had my tie? Where was the coffee mug? Why aren't your shoes on already? <laughs> yeah, I'm preaching this morning because we're gathered together to listen to what the Lord has to say to us and come again in reality and authenticity to say that we don't have to do that. Because of the empty cross, they've been paid for, and we should be glad. This is the day that changes everything. As I'm getting older in my life, I am not privy to the new and cool music that is often out there. My sons have taught me about the Avit Brothers, a cool band that really speaks to the heart of the human condition. And there's kind of a, a brother band that goes along with it. It's called Mumford and Sons. And this is the words out of a song when one of them really engaged and found true love for the first time. It says, love that will not betray you, dismay you, or enslave you. It will set you free. Be more like the man or woman you were meant to be. This is a design, an alignment to cry. At my heart you see the beauty of love as it was meant to be. That's who we are designed to be, brothers and sisters, to love each other with grace, with care, and with a redemptive heart. The real obstacle to community is often ourselves. The human being's state of fearful self-protection. Theologians describe this phrase as homo incarvatus, which is humanity curved in on itself, that we pay attention to ourself instead of what's out there. We see that in a selfie world, don't we? Click, 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 click. Who are we? How many teenagers, sorry teenagers, do we see walking down the mall side by side, not looking at each other, not talking to each other, busy texting? We're forgetting how to... You're raising your hand. <laughs> That's awesome. Confession is the first way to, to get the redemption, man. That's right. <clears throat> We've forgotten how to communicate with each other, to look at each other's in the eyes, to see each other with our heart, and to welcome each other into real relationship. How do you define happiness? Think about it for a moment. I suspect our idea of happiness is linked to our obsession, sometimes our assumptions of our subculture. <clears throat> For some, happiness is a bigger house. For others, it's an organic vegan diet. But freedom, at least, freedom that God offers us, invites us to envision a larger reality, a reality beyond the preferences of any subculture or rules of a family system, beyond the smaller forms of happiness and lesser forms of virtue. As theologian N.T. Wright puts it, people who are called to be God's free and freedom-bringing people must learn to live as God's free people, giving up the habit of slavery, because slavery is so much more in the mind than it ever is in the physical sense. Learning to be having the art of responsible and free living. Slavery comes in many forms, including forms of happy and virtuous life, because we become a slave to that thing, a slave to the virtue. A happy and virtuous life, I would argue, is living and practicing God's future reality now. This reality is set in the context of the first Exodus story, and we are reminded that today Jesus brings us through the Passover of death into new and eternal life. <clears throat> happiness is not a freedom from, but a freedom for a life of love, a life of mission, and a life of compassion. Happiness emerges from the recognition that God's grace not only frees us from Egypt, but sends us into the wilderness to be released from our own attachments and to become agents of restoration for others. Happier they, knowing that grace can live in the world without being of the world. And who, by following Jesus Christ, are so assured of their heavenly citizenship that they are truly free to live in this world. It's this vision of a happy life that Jesus announces and paid for on Easter.
reminded that the word gospel means good news of Jesus Christ. And we don't keep good news to ourselves, do we? We show it. We share it. We invite others to be a part of it. We see that in Paul's reading to the Corinthians this morning when he is talking to his brothers and to those who have been there before. He says, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel, the good news that is preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. For this gospel and by this gospel, you are saved. For that is what I received and that is what I pass on of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, he was raised, and on the third day, according, he rose again and appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, and finally appeared to more than 500 over the case, course of the next 50 days. So brothers and sisters, we have what's called the great 50 days now that we've hit Easter all the way to Pentecost. And that is an incredible opportunity to hear what God has done. Now hear this without guilt or without judgment because Episcopalians don't do guilt. For those of you that come Christmas and Easter, we're glad you're here. But you miss the whole story. You hear the beginning, you see the middle, you don't get to understand the end and the impact that it has on you. So I challenge you, I invite you, come back for the next six weeks. See what God can and will do in your life. See how he will meet you where you are, but loves you enough to not leave you there. He invites us always to more, more debt, more freedom, more love, more redemption. Because our spiritual lives are so much more than some accessory we put on when it's convenient or when it suits us. Because our life in Christ is our identity and one that was paid for by the blood of the lamb that died for you and for me because on this day this day of resurrection not only are we free to be our authentic selves we are free from the fear of death for now we see in death the gateway to eternal life through what christ has done for us may we rejoice together in the knowledge of the resurrection and the awareness of the freedom of the heart and the mind healing those things that are past so that we don't have to carry them with them into our present and we can live a more free and blessed future all the days to come. That is the gift presented to us today. The cost has been paid, his sacrifice offered. And if we choose to accept it, if we choose to engage it, if we choose to believe in it, brothers and sisters, we are slaves no more. Christ has died. Christ is risen, and today, brothers and sisters, we are reminded Christ will come again. Amen? Amen. Happy Easter. Amen.